So quite recently there has been yet another 3D printer that caught fire and burned down. Luckily in that case no one was hurt and the building still stands but this isn't the first time this has happened. Every few months you'll hear one of these horror stories of a 3D printer in one way or another becoming more volatile than it should have been and way too often is it that it's just by a hair that it didn't burn the entire house down. So in this video let's go through what the most common fire hazards are on a 3D printer, how you can make each one less dangerous and what it can do to prevent larger fires in the case that something should go wrong that is out of your control either way. There is no de facto 100% safety with really anything but there are a lot of low hanging fruits that you can easily fix on our 3D production machines so let's check those out. Okay, so pretty much all the ways a 3D printer could fail are electrical fires, which means it's wires, connectors or individual components getting so hot that either some of the plastic insulation starts burning or it ignites something else that the wire is touching. So a few versions of wire insulation and connectors are actually flame retardant, meaning that should something overheat, the plastic is going to melt, but even with an open flame touching it, there is an added chemical in here that will keep it from actively burning itself. However, most other parts on a 3D printer are typically not flame retardant. Obviously the frame of a 3D printer is the biggest flammable part if it is flammable. So let's see, this is pretty bad. I mean it's wood, mechanically it's a great material but it would make great kindling in a campfire as well. This acrylic frame, this is from the Anet A8, still going to burn pretty well. I mean this is going to be a decent sized fire if it does go down but an all metal frame like on the CR10 or on the Prusa machines uh, is of course not going to burn at least under normal conditions. I'm just going to assume you're not printing in a 100% pure oxygen atmosphere where aluminum will actually burn. And that was I believe the main culprit with the recently burned down a 8 uh, which uses that acrylic frame. But even with a metal frame, uh, there are still some plastic parts in here, for example uh, the plastic wrap or nylon mesh in this case um, or the v-slot covers that will actually burn. Also printed or injection molded parts, those will burn. If you're 3D printing parts for your next 3D printer it might be a good idea to use one of the newer flame retardant filaments. I personally really like this very filament, this is Austrian Aprinta Pro flame retardant PC ABS Prints great, doesn't burn, link in the description. Of course you should also check the surroundings of your machine, so don't necessarily use them on wooden shelves or enclosures, but pick something like a metal shelf instead. Like I don't know who would put their 3D printer in a wooden box, that sounds irresponsible? Okay but really you don't want to let it get that far. If your 3D printer is already on fire it is kind of too late, you know. There are two factors to keeping your printer running well. The first one is the hardware being well built and up to the task and well specced. And the second one is the firmware's sanity checks that kick in before anything substantial goes wrong. So if you follow along here, I mean I wouldn't say that your 3D printer is going to be infallible or anything, but at least trustworthy enough to run overnight. I've run my printers for thousands of hours now and have never had an issue. Okay so first off let's check your electronics. The main thing to look here are connectors and the general power handling area. Let's start with connectors. So the classic connector is actually this one right here, this green pluggable type. And this is actually a really good connector if you're using a version from a reputable manufacturer. These right here on the trams are made by RIA, RIA and are rated for 12 amps. Since the biggest loader heated bed typically draws somewhere around those 12 amps. Now these Kefeng ones on this cheap ramps are supposedly rated for 20 amps but they're only guaranteeing a resistance that is twice as high as the RIA ones. So that means this one is actually going to heat up twice as much already at the same current and yet still allows more current than the rear one? Something doesn't quite add up with these. What you often see with these cheaper ones is that the plastic shroud around the connectors melts as the spring connectors in here overheat. Has that happened to me before? The smell really isn't that nice. Next up we have these screw connectors and what's common with all these is that they have some sort of flap in here that protects the wiring. So it's not just the screw itself pressing down on the copper strands but an intermediary layer that will not shear off the individual strands. If you're using some screw clamp that does not have that you will need to either use solid core wiring 
or add a wire and crimp. So skipping past the Do-It Wi-Fi here for a second, which obviously has this massive connector pair for the power input and the heated bed output, what you'll often see are these blue connector blocks. On the side here, it actually says, maybe in this one, yeah. It says 16 amps, 250 volts. How much you trust that rating is up to you when a higher quality uh, RIA one of the same type will only be rated for 13 amps. But I mean, overall, these are actually quite decent. What's not decent is this uh, green screw connector on the MKS Gen right here. It even says on its side, it is a 10 amp connector. And you potentially want to push the total current for a 12 volt heated bed, a three amp heater, two of those actually, stepper drivers, fans, etc., through this single connector, which can all add up to 20, 25 amps. And you're pushing that through a single connector that is rated for 10 amps. And that's already the uh, optimistic rating. So in those cases, my general recommendation is just to bypass the connector entirely. Solder some decent gauge wires directly to the bottom of the PCB and just don't use the connector if you can avoid it. You know, any connector is just another potential point of failure. So if you can take that out, that's even better. If you do use these connectors, here's two tips on how you can reliably use them. First of all, double and triple check that the screw connector types are tight. Give your wire a tug. If you can easily pull it out by hand, it was not tight enough. Also, if you don't totally trust your connectors, come back after two weeks of use and just check whether they need to be snugged up again. If they keep loosening, don't use them. And the second tip, do not tin wire ends that go into a screw connector. Even if it's tempting to make the end neater and all, but if you see tinned wires from the factory in a kit, snip off that tinning and strip off a fresh bit of bare copper wire. The reason here is that with tin, even when cold, it will still flow slightly under pressure. Think of this like a bowl of cookie dough that you drop an anvil into, just in really, really slow motion. So over time, a screw connector with a tinned wire that might feel super snug when you first tighten it, could turn into a super loose connection that sparks out and overheats at some point down the road. Next up, MOSFETs. These switch the output to the heated bed, the hot ends and the fans, but the only one that's critical here is the heated bed. As a general rule of thumb, if the MOSFET on your mainboard needs a heatsink to stay cool, like on the ANIT 8 board right there, or gets too hot to the touch in the first place, it's a flawed design with the wrong component choice. Amperage rating on a MOSFET means nothing if you use the wrong type, so often you'll see something like 20 amps being advertised, but really, that is for a completely different setups than how the boards are actually using the MOSFET. I go into a bit more detail on this video right here, but basically, with smart component choices, these tiny MOSFETs, it's actually these, these square chips back here, that's all you need in a properly engineered solution. So again, if you have MOSFETs on your board that get too hot, we even need to use a heatsink, you might think about swapping them for better suited ones or just upgrading the board in its entirety. The other thing to look for are fuses. Now, admittedly, I'm not paying as much attention to them as I should be too, but they are kind of important. Now, think about this for a second. Your power supply can supply typically around 25 or 30 amps. So in total, it can output that maximum amount of current before it shuts off for safety. So if you short out the output right there on the supply, it will just shut down, nothing's gonna happen. But imagine, for example, you get a short right here at the heater cartridge, or even right in the heater cartridge. Now the only resistance at the output is the MOSFET in the board and the wires as the actual load is shorted out. And that often means there's now enough current flowing through the wiring that obviously isn't made for these sort of currents, but there's still not enough flowing to trip the power supply over current protection. So what you need is individual fuses at every single output, ideally, not just at the input. Um, this is split up in two. That's already better than one big fuse going across it because again, the power supply itself already has that self-protection built in, but it is way too lenient to protect each individual lower power output. So as a rule of thumb, a good safe fuse level is at least 20% over the current you're expecting. So for a 12 volt, 30 watt heater cartridge, the typical rating these days, that typically draws around two and a half amps. A three amp fuse is really good and safe. And for a 12 volt heated bed, which is usually around 12 amps, a 15 amp fuse is a good choice. I like these automotive fuses and the appropriate holders for them. They're really cheap. Well, definitely cheaper than replacing a burned down printer. They're available everywhere and in all the current ratings you'd need. They work up to 32 volts, so either a 12 or a 24 volt 3D printer is going to be okay for them. 
And yeah, they're super easy to use. Link in the description for these exact ones. The other actually quite dangerous thing I see way too often is heater wires without strain relief. This is a ticking time bomb, basically. Yeah, it, it will be fine for maybe the first year or so until the warranty runs out, haha, -ha, but what will happen over time is as these wires get bent back and forth over and over, you can also already see it on these, you know, a 3D printer tends to do that, it, it tends to have very repetitive motion, is that over time, the individual strands of wire in here start weakening and eventually break. If you own an iPhone charging cord, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And, you know, at that spot where the strands of wire start breaking, you're reducing the gauge of the wire to only the few strands that are left. But of course, the current is still the same. So that spot right there starts heating up and faster than you know it, you've got an electrical fire right there. So two things you can do here. First, create a strain relief. Your wires will still need to bend the same amount for the same amount of motion, but now it's being spread out over more of a length, so it's not just this super sharp radius right here, but a longer section. A few good and effective solutions I've seen on various printers, this one is actually quite good where all the wires are tied to the Bowden tube, but for example flexible conduit around all the wires, this bundles up your wiring really nice and tight and makes the entire thing more rigid, which is actually what you're going for, but you need to take care that you attach both ends in a way where they cannot flex and therefore create an even sharper bend. This stuff is available in all sorts of sizes, but try to use a size as small as possible because they do get really large, bulky, and too rigid with the larger sizes. Another good solution is spiral wrap. Now, by itself, it doesn't support the wires enough. It bundles them well, but it doesn't keep them from kinking. So a good fix for that is to use a piece of semi-flexible filament like a nylon. Secure that to the moving part, again to keep it from kinking in that same spot over and over, and then wrapping that in with the rest of the wires. And of course, if you want to go completely overboard, you can use drag chains. Of all these solutions, drag chains are the only real engineered solution, which means you'll get a guaranteed lifetime for them from the manufacturer if you size everything right. But typically, just stuffing your existing wiring into some of this tiny drag chain might actually be a downgrade over using something like plastic conduit. And that brings us to that second part, proper cables for moving setups. Now, there are specific cables that you can buy for drag chains and such, but a good first step in the right direction is using cables with a more flexible insulation and with finer strands on the inside. What's actually a really nice choice here is the silicone wire used in RC cars, because that has a very flexible silicone insulation is heat resistant and typically has very thin stranding. So, you know, those are all things intended for lowering the risk at the source, but there are a few more ways that you can safeguard against that last bit of risk, like the heater cartridge falling out of your hot end. Supposedly, that's what caused that NNA to go up in flames. So modern, well-configured firmers will have sanity checks on actually a lot of things. It's going to check for reasonable temperature readings from the thermistor in the hot end and the bed. It takes into account at what rate your heaters are getting up to temperature. It makes sure that when everything is at temperature, what it's reading, for example, from the hot end, whether that is close to the temperature it's expecting, and that protects against that exact case of the heater or the thermistor falling out of the heater block. By default, these checks are enabled in a fresh version of Marlin. Obviously, do it doesn't run Marlin, but... Um, this does, but some manufacturers choose to disable those safety checks because with the grade of components they use, those safeguards sometimes trigger when they shouldn't and create that false positive and then emergency stop a print even though everything is fine-ish. But in either case, I'd recommend you do enable them and reflash the firmware and while you're at it, upgrade to a new version of Marlin and that's going to come with more features and often better performance and reliability as well. Lastly, there are a few things outside your 3D printer that you can use to monitor and protect your machines. Octoprint with a camera is a great solution to keep an eye on your machine. A smoke detector, mine's right over there, is totally, totally, well not just recommended, but I'd say very much mandatory if you're running a 3D printer unattended. There are even connected ones now that will send a text or an email when they detect anything, or as a simpler version, a set that's connected wirelessly, and if one alarm goes off, so do all the other ones. That's actually what I'm using. So if your printer in the basement spontaneously combusts, you'll hear it in the third floor bedroom as well. This has actually happened to me, not with a 3D printer, but with an RC car, so I'm pretty fond of these connected smoke alarms. They work really well. 
And if you want to go one step further, you can even install one of those automatic kitchen fire extinguishers over your printer. Basically, these have a fuse in them. If fire touches that, it will set off a charge of fire suppressant that should extinguish any small fire like on a 3D printer. Overall, you know, it's not that hard to get your 3D printer to a level that makes it at least uh, trustworthy and gives you the peace of mind to let it run overnight or while you're out grocery shopping for an hour. But again, common sense still applies and you know your machine best. And if you want to check out any of the materials or software I talked about, you can find those all linked in the video description below. Before we go today, a big shout out to all my patrons who in fact make it possible for me to run this channel as a full-time job. Special thanks to long-term patrons Mike Jackson, Matthew Bird, Neil Youngberg, Philip Gawk that have all been with the channel ever since 2016. That is awesome. Then Hussein Karata, Sven Müller, Paul Arden, Luke Ingemann, Gunny W, Rudolf Wang, Woody Boyd, William Divine, Bobby C.C. Wong, who have all joined just in the first half of 2017. Then Francisco Peebles, Robert Malaki, Matthias Peshek, Michelle Hjörleifsson, Remco Katz, Phyllis Struder, Fidget, and uh, Jeffrey Nicolacci, as well as Andy Smith and 3D Passion that joined before the start of 2018. And finally, Marek Zera, Andy Fair, Dexter Gillette, what an awesome name, and Michael Waits that joined just in 2018. Thank you all and all the other patrons that are supporting the channel. And if you want to join in, you can do that right here. But most importantly, if you like the video, let me know by hitting that thumbs up. If you want to see more like it, get subscribed. Fun fact, YouTube actually shows me how many of you subscribe from each video. So if you click that subscribe button now, that will be my indicator from you that yes, this is the type of content that you came here for. Also, you probably don't want to miss new videos. So do click that bell after you hit the subscribe button. And lastly, because safety is an important topic, feel free to share this video if you think someone you know could learn something from it. As always, thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one.